Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Today we celebrate Juneteenth, which was designated a national holiday two years ago by President Biden. This historic event marked the first new federal holiday since the adoption of Martin Luther King Jr. Day in 1983. PBS Books is thrilled to reshare this amazing conversation with scholar and author Annette Gordon-Reed about her book, Juneteenth. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining our conversation this evening with Annette Gordon-Reed in, in partnership with WETA and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, ASALA. PBS Books is proud to partner with the Library of Congress in sharing the National Book Festival with audiences across the country as we promote their festival and the PBS broadcast. Tonight's conversation is an important part of this series. I'd like to welcome WETA's visionary leader, Sharon Percy Rockefeller. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you, Heather. I'm so pleased to welcome you to this special event, a collaboration of WETA, PBS Books, and the Library of Congress. I am Sharon Rockefeller, President and CEO of WETA, the flagship PBS station in the nation's capital. I also serve on the James Madison Council at the Library of Congress. What our organizations share, as do all of us gathered today, is a profound love of reading. Throughout my entire life, Books have been magical for me. Reading transports us to other places, helps us understand other people and experiences, and expands our imaginations. The Library of Congress National Book Festival is a joyous celebration of the wonderful gift of reading in our lives. Whether attending an in-person event listening to a podcast, or logging in to the virtual conversations, thank you for joining this celebration. Today we are honored to be joined by eminent scholar and author Annette Gordon-Reed, the Carl M. Loeb Professor of History at Harvard University. I was thoroughly fascinated by her Pulitzer Prize winning book, the Hemingses of Monticello, an American family, and her collaboration with my friend Vernon Jordan on his memoir. Now with her new collection of essays entitled On Juneteenth, Professor Gordon Reed sets her very personal reflections of growing up in Texas in dialogue with her curiosity as an historian, as she explores the past and current meaning of Juneteenth. We are so happy to welcome her to the festival. Thank you for joining us for this conversation as we open a book and open the world. Well, Sharon, I couldn't agree more. The love of reading is magical. Um, and I. And before we begin, I'd like to thank our library partners and numerous PBS stations across the country for sharing this important content with all of you out there. But most importantly, we'd like to thank you for joining us this evening. Today's conversation celebrates trailblazing author Annette Gordon-Reed, exploring her writing and her recently released book on Juneteenth. Annette will be featured in the National Book Festival and will also be featured in the one hour broadcast themed Open a Book, Open the World. Let's take a moment and watch the trailer. Hi everybody, I'm LeVar Burton and this is Open a Book, Open the World, the Library of Congress National Book Festival. When I try and create a work, work of fiction, one of my big aims is to create an entire world. 
And I think that kind of fictional world and how see, we, we see characters express their thoughts and feelings, that for me is opening up the world. I believe that narrative nonfiction is the closest that many of us will ever get to being another person. And that sense of empathy is good for anybody, but it's also particularly important, I think, for writers, because that's one of our most important tools is the capacity for empathy. I think uh, there's many places that I met for the very first time through a book. For me, books were a way of learning about the world and experiencing things I had never experienced before. Books have always just shown me just how big and how small the world is. A good book can take you on a journey. And after the last year, we are all ready to plot a new course and books can be an amazing compass. An addiction to reading has been a key secret of my success. It was literature that opened up so many pathways, so many possibilities for me. I read books so I could discover new worlds in those books. I, I had books, I don't, I don't even think of like, like this room, I don't think I had books in, but I had like 50, 60 books in this room. It's enlarging your horizon, it's your, books are everything. It gives me more of a complex understanding of humanity, which I think is the power of stories, that we are able to see ourselves in all manner of different character. And that, I think, is what I enjoy from a great book. Join me as some of our nation's leading literary voices bring us a sense of renewal, discuss their newest work, and open up a whole new world of possibilities. This PBS Library of Congress Open a Book, Open the World special premiered this past Sunday on many PBS stations across the country. It continues to be able to be streamed at pbs.org and can be seen on WIDA tonight at 9 p.m. on WIDA Metro, Saturday, September 18th at 7 p.m. and Sunday, September 19th at 1.30 on WETA PBS. It can also be seen Sunday, September 19th at 2 p.m. on WIDA Metro. The Library of Congress National Book Festival launches on September 17th and runs through the 26th. For more information, go to loc.gov slash bookfest. And just so you don't miss it, a reminder, it is actually at 1.30 on September 19th in Washington, D.C. and 2 p.m. Well, it is my honor to welcome a representative from the Library of Congress, um, Roswell Encina. Roswell? Hi, Heather. It's a pleasure to join you tonight. And we're very excited to welcome everyone to the National Book Festival starting this Friday. As everyone mentioned, you could curate or you know create your own National Book Festival adventure, whether watching the PBS special at 9 o'clock tonight or watching the videos on demand starting on Friday or listening to podcasts or even participating in some on-person events at the Library of Congress starting next week. So, you know, we are missing a lot of people seeing everyone at the Washington Convention Center, but we hope, you know, going on a virtual platform that we're connecting to our readers and a lot of people who are just passionate about books coast to coast, whether you're in Kansas City or Montgomery, Alabama or Los Angeles or right here in DC, that you could still enjoy the National Book Festival. So we hope to see everybody soon and enjoy tonight's conversation. Heather? Just a quick question for you before you go. Is it only for adults or is this also for kids and YA? Who is this for? It's for everyone. You know, we've got authors for children. We have Lupita Nyong'o talking about her beautiful children's book. We have um, authors for teens, like we have Jason Reynolds and of course, we have fiction and nonfiction and historians and best-selling authors. So it's absolutely for everyone. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we hope to see everyone there online. Thanks, all right. <laughs> Thanks, Roswell. So now the moment you've all been waiting for. It is my extraordinary pleasure to introduce trailblazing author Annette Gordon-Reed. Annette Go Gordon-Reed is the Carl M. Loeb University Professor at Harvard. Gordon Reed won 16 book prizes, including the Pulitzer Prize in History in 2009 and the National Book Award in 2008. She is, has written numerous articles, reviews, books. She is the current president of the Ames Foundation. 
A selection of her honors include fellowship from the Dorothy and Lewis E. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, a Guggenheim Fellowship in the Humanities, a MacArthur Fellowship, the National Humanities Medal, the National Book Award, and the Frederick Douglass Book Prize. She was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2011 and was a member of the Academy's Commission on the Humanities and Social Sciences. In 2019, she was elected as a member of the American Philosophical Society. Welcome, Annette. Glad to be here. Thank yeah. you for inviting me. Thank you so much. And to guide today's conversation, I'm personally honored to have trailblazer Erica Armstrong Dunbar. She is the Charles and Mary Beard Distinguished Professor of History at Rutgers University, the New Brunswick Director of the Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice and the National Director of the Association of Black Women Historians. She is an accomplished scholar who has written numerous articles and books, including Never Caught in 2017, National Book Award finalist for nonfiction and 2018 Frederick Douglass Book Award. And she came to slay the life and times of Harriet Tubman. She is no stranger to the National Book Festival. In fact, she recently was featured both in 2018 and 2020. In fact, her interview at the National Book Festival can still be seen. Um, and if you look in the chat, it is being put in there right now if you'd like to watch that later. Um, she really is dedicated and her work focuses on the uncomfortable concepts of slavery, racial injustice, and gender equality. Welcome, Erica. We are so happy to have you here. Oh, it's so great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, before I turn over the reins to you for the conversation, I'd just like to remind all of our audience members, if you have a question, please put it in the chat at the end of the conversation. Erica and I will be asking Annette some of your questions. And so without further ado, please enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Well, it is an absolute honor uh, and a privilege to be uh, leading this conversation with uh, eminent scholar and field shifting historian, Annette Gordon-Reed, and to have the opportunity uh, to really think about, talk about uh, this new work uh, on Juneteenth. And let me just first say hello to <laughs> It's good to see you and um, really just such an honor to be in conversation with you uh, and to talk about this really important book. This is, this is a special book. Um, when I read it, uh, I thought about, first of all, how different it is from your other work, mm -hmm. but also in many ways, each, each chapter, each essay, is a meditation about Juneteenth mm -hmm. and its importance, but it's also deeply personal. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could start us um, in conversation talking about how and why you decided to write this book and to write it this way. Mm -hmm. Well, first I'd like to say it's great talking to you. It's been a while. <laughs> We've all been out of commission here. Um, you know, it, it's a personal work. It's some. It's unlike, as you said, anything that I've done before. I wanted to write a book about growing up in Texas. After I finished the book, I was cleaning out a closet and going through boxes, and I found an essay that I had written uh, about integrating the schools in my hometown. And so it was pretty much a, a precursor to uh, the second chapter of this book. And that was written a long time ago. I mean, it's in courier type, so you get a sense of how long ago that must have been. I've wanted to talk about these things for a long time. And the pandemic, where we were sort of holed up in New York, uh, I'm in my office here in Cambridge now, but I was have been back in New York um, for the past 18 months. It was a time to reflect on my life as it had been before, to think about my parents, 
neither of whom are living and I missing them and wanting to connect to them. And that's really what it was, was trying to find some way to talk about, well, Texas history, but do it through my family's story as a way of connecting to my mother and father and, and, and people who are no longer with me, who were very, very important to me when I was growing up. So it was in some ways cathartic, a ter therapeutic in a way to be able to do that. Uh, and to have this connection to my family. I'm typically writing about other people's families. And this was just deeply personal for me and very helpful to me as I thought about was going through the weighty matters of living through a pandemic, thinking about all the things that were happening on the racial front uh, with George Floyd's murder and then all the protests after that. It was just, it was a time to reflect upon race and family and history, I thought. Yeah, can, can we um, just dig a little deeper into the, you know, I think it's important when we think about when books are written, right? Mm -hmm. And the sort of moment in time that you were writing this book is, um, I think, important for us to to talk about, to hash out a little bit, and to really just ask you, a, in the, in somewhat of a sort of personal way, what affects the the summer of 2020, and we could argue sort of before that. Um, what the effects were of that moment and you writing writing this book? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we here in Manhattan, uh, it, we were sort of ground zero for COVID. Uh, when I took walks with my husband out in Central Park, we could see the tents that were put up, put in place to handle the overflow of uh, patients who you know, had come to the hospital because of all of this. And, you know, in the in the weeks before then, I had been hearing lots of sirens and I was sort of annoyed about it, thinking, what, why are all these sirens? What's going on here? Of course, I didn't realize that this was before the news broke about all of this and people understood what was going on, that this was a part of this whole process. It was a time of thinking about mortality, thinking about life and how fragile it is and how we are with all of our uh, technology and all of our knowledge, we could be laid low by a virus. <laughs> Viruses and bacteria really control us in ways that we don't uh, typically think, but this was bringing it home in a big way. Then there was the question of uh, George Floyd that happened around the time, you know, of within the, the ballpark of thinking about Juneteenth, which brought the holiday itself, mm -hmm. I think, much more to the fore because people were thinking about what is this about? Why why do we have these kinds of situations? And then people thought you think about race and you think about slavery, which as you well know, created a racial hierarchy or deepened the racial hierarchy. And we're still living with that. The notion of, of the unsafe um, situation that many African-American people feel in, in urban, well, not just urban areas, around in general. And so it was a moment, the reckoning that that word that everybody uses, and this was a time to think about race. And I grew up in a state where race was a central question from the very beginning of, you know, early on in my life. So this was, it brought all of this home to me and wanted to be able to comment on that in a way that would be useful. I mean, if not writing directly about George Floyd, writing directly about the pandemic, but these issues of mortality, the issues of race, all of those things are part of the book because those were the things that were floating around in my head as I was working on it. Yeah, and I you know, I think one of, one of the things that's very clear is that this is a book also about um, Texas history, right? This is a book about Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if we can spend a little bit of time talking about that, talking about how this book helps us better understand um, Texas as a state. Mm -hmm. uh, and and to ask the question, does it, does it recast Texas? Well, you know, I could not have imagined how Texas, how much Texas and the ways in which Texas would be in the news when this book came out. I mean, you know, not, not in great ways, I'm afraid. Um, but Texas has always been a focus of of people in the United States because of its sort of outsized image, because of the image of the cowboy, not just in the United States, but all over the world. I did a language study program when I was in college in France, and my French family knew all about Texas, but what they knew was cowboys. And I wanted to show and to make plain to people that Texas has another heritage. 
It's not just cattlemen and cow and cowboys and ranchers and, and oil men. There were plantation owners in Texas. Texas was a slave society. And that part of it, the part of East Texas where most people live, really I don't think is on the radar screen for most Americans. It's all about um, West Texas and, and the cowboy and the oil man. And even though the, the first big oil strike was in East Texas, everything gets transferred to West Texas because I think it's a more palatable story. It's not, a, there are no black people. Mm -hmm. There's no, I mean, there's racial conflict, but it's racial conflict between Anglo and Hispanic people, Latino uh, uh, conflict, but that's even played down uh, a bit. And it really is more about cowboys and uh, cattlemen, but the plantation owner who really started the sort of the main reason for Texas. I mean, Stephen F. Austin, who is considered the father of Texas, founded Texas and brought settlers to Texas with the full expectation, the full hope that it would be a slave society. He, you know, he said it outright that they're not going to be able to prosper. People would not be able to prosper. Whites would not be able to prosper if they came there without enslaved people to clear the land um, and turn it into a part of the cotton empire, which is what they wanted to do. I don't think people think about Texas and slavery in the same way that they do Mississippi, for example, or Alabama, or Georgia, those, you know, the big mansions and Tara and all of that stuff. That's not what Texas is about. So this book tries to recenter things to sort of say, hey, the most populous part of this state the reason the state was started, the reason it was a controversial place, the reason many people did not want it to come into the union was because of the institution of slavery. And so much that happens there is more ex explicable if you, if you know that, if you focus on that. So yeah, it is a way of trying to change people's attitudes about the, about the state. And if you're just joining us, you're watching PBS Books. I'm Erica Armstrong Dunbar, and we're here with Pulitzer Prize winning author Annette Gordon-Reed in celebration of the Library of Congress's National Book Festival. Um, I, you know, when I was reading this book, one of the things that struck me is, it, of course, you know, I know the story of, of slavery in, in Texas and throughout the South, if not throughout um, the colonies um, in New England. But one of the things that struck me that I wasn't anticipating when I read this book was, um, I think it was your uh, fourth chapter, and it was um, the way you capture or attach a narrative about indigenous life mm -hmm. and Texas, mm -hmm. and in this moment, in a book that's focusing on Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I didn't expect it, and actually, um, was um, wildly mesmerized by this chapter. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you made the decision to link mm -hmm. uh, that history, that narrative to mm -hmm. Juneteenth. Well, what I, I wanted to make the point in this book that Texas didn't have to become diverse. It was not a state that became diverse over time. It was diverse from the very beginning. And you start with indigenous people, all different types of group, groups who encounter the Spanish and then have difficulties with the Anglo uh, Europeans who come over and enslave people. I wanted all of the groups in Texas to be represented, to talk about the fact that they influenced one another. I end the book talking about the fact that part of our family Juneteenth um, celebration was making tamales, which is, we think of now as a Mexican dish, but obviously it's a dish that was related to Indians as well. Uh, the Aztecs, people who saw it as a, a uh, an important type of, uh, of food, a different, uh, an important dish, to have all of these things together, these cultural influences that meld together in this place that was, as I said, diverse from the very, very beginning. And I don't think you can talk about Texas history, if you want to talk about the, the progress of the state, the good points and the bad points, without mentioning that there was this clash between the people who were there to begin with and the people who became as settlers. And some cooperation between African 
uh, Americans and Native Americans, but also some instances where Native Americans held African Americans as slaves, as, as whites did as well. So we want to think about all of the different aspects, all the things that are taking place there in this, this, this society that just seems you know, so, so difficult, <laughs> so um, complex and very hard in lots of ways. And so I, I really thought it was important not to leave that out. And plus, you know, when I was growing up in my formative years um, in, in the 70s, I'm dating myself here, uh, the American Indian movement was really, really prominent. And so that was a part that the fashions, you know, the beads, the bracelets, all of those kinds of things were a big part of my life during that time period. So if I'm thinking about my, I can't think about my childhood and my young, uh, my teen years without thinking about the fact that uh, the struggle of Native Americans in Texas, but also in the in the country at large, was really a, a prime focus um, in in our lives. I I remember that moment of reading about um, tamales towards the the end of the book and. You know, towards towards the end of the book, you you take us through the the days, the months, the years following um, General Order Number Three, mm -hmm. uh, and we think we often think of Juneteenth as um, a bookend in many ways. But mm -hmm. you remind us um, about the aftermath of freedom. Uh, and what it meant specifically for, for Black folks in Texas. And you help us do this through your, your great-grandparents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you, should we think about Juneteenth as an ending, as a beginning, mm -hmm. as both? Well, I, you know, that's a good, very good question. I, I think it was both. I mean, it was the end for those people the end of the legalized capacity uh, that that uh, enslavers had to separate families, uh, to do the thing that was, as you know, the most painful part of of slavery. I mean, the whipping, the working for no money, all those things were were terrible, but the possibility and the actuality of being separated from your family legally was what uh, was, was haunted people um, so much. And this push, I, I'm convinced, these push for family reunions and homecomings, all those kinds of things, I think, are in, in American African American culture, are related to that, the trauma of that, and dealing with the trauma of that, and trying to keep it at bay by saying, now we can be together. So that ended, that part of it ended, but it was the beginning of a struggle. Um, and they understood that from the very beginning, as I talk about and say in the book, there were celebrations, but there were people who did not want them to celebrate and punish them for celebrating. It was a dangerous thing to do, to express black joy at what had happened, um, was a dangerous kind of thing. And yet they did. I mean, I, I, I love the story about uh, the four men who bought land in Houston to have a park, to have a place where people would celebrate it. And so that's a, it's, they're thinking about the future. What does it mean when you, when you buy land for that particular purpose? You're thinking that down the generations, people are gonna come there and they're gonna celebrate. And that's what happened. It's been going on 156 years. I mean, Emancipation Park in Houston um, has been there uh, since the 1870s. And the celebrations even before they had that were, were going on as well. I've been there. and that connection to the past, the past to the present and thinking about the future is really, really profound. So I think Juneteenth is about, it, it's the end of chattel slavery in Texas, not the end of slavery, as you know, the end of slavery, the legal end is later on when the 13th amendment is finally ratified at the end of 1865, but the end of the military struggle to preserve slavery took place in June of 1865, when the army of the Trans-Mississippi, the Confederate army surrenders. And they surrendered and were defeated in large measure because of the infusion of black male troops who go to Galveston with Gordon Granger and who issues general order number three. 
and are in control of the city. And it must have been a wonderful and amazing thing <laughs> for African American people to enslave people to see that and to see the liberation being liberated by uh, you know, some themselves, self liberation. Many ran away, but also uh, black troops who gave their lives and fought for uh, the end of slavery. So something ends, but something begins and they understand that this is gonna be a struggle and they wanted to keep the memory of this day and of what happened alive. And that's why I think Juneteenth is important. So now Juneteenth is a federal holiday. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you're writing your book, um, that was not the case. Yeah. And then so I'm wondering what your response was to um, the announcement that it was indeed now a um, a federal holiday, and um, how that resonates as someone who was writing on Juneteenth, uh, and then this announcement comes. Well, that you know, that was a surprise for me. I mentioned the effort that had been made that was being made to do this. And I, you know, I, I didn't see myself as necessarily a part of that. I certainly didn't write the book uh, for that purpose, but it was, it was stunning. I mean, one day it was, I guess a Wednesday or something. I got this uh, message. I read somewhere that um, the uh, Senate, the person who had objected to it uh, for who'd held it up last year, relented. And so the Senate, approved it and then the house approved it and then the next thing i know i i got an email from the white house um asking me if i would come down for the signing ceremony and this was all in the space of like two or three days and i you know the the signing ceremony was in the afternoon so you know i'm on a plane i jump on a plane on 90 minutes later and go down there for it and it was a wonderful occasion uh it was not something that could have been planned and uh, not something that I had in my mind. I thought it was going to happen, but I thought it might happen later on, you know, maybe next year or the year after that. But it was, a, you know, I was very happy for Miss Opal Lee, who, uh, who has been the Texan who has been campaigning for this for many years. Uh, in her 90s, she started this when she was like 89 years old, walking and, you know, uh, to get people to to uh, to draw attention to uh, her quest to make this a a federal holiday, and she was at the ceremony, so that was actually quite nice. I, we'd done a couple of programs together beforehand, so it was nice to see her there, and have the president single her out and talk about her efforts. So it was a happy day. I mean, it's not the you know it's not the it's not voting rights, <laughs> you know. We still have a still have to do, you know. I, I don't want you don't want to say that this is. It's a good thing. I think it's a good thing that it became a, a federal holiday. But in keeping with the spirit of that, with the spirit of the people of that time, it's a struggle. We still have stuff to do, and you know, to honor the people who survived and had faith and went forward, we have to we have to work to see that their their dreams actually come true. So uh, voting rights, all those kinds of things are still important, but I was happy to see the day uh, become a federal holiday. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a marker. As you say, it's a marker on this road. Um, I asked the question, you know, Juneteenth, a beginning or an end? Um, and we could ask the same thing or question the, the question about it becoming a holiday. You know, it's <laughs> not necessary. It's not an end. We know that it's, um, perhaps inspiration about uh, the journey we still have uh, to travel. And I'm, you know, one of the things that's perfect about this book is that it's really teachable. Um, and for those of us who write books and especially nonfiction, mm -hmm. sometimes we struggle with, you know, how to write in a way that is accessible and this is a different writing style for you also. Mm -hmm. Would you mind just talking a little bit about that process, about your stylistic change? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when I was growing up, I thought I would be a writer. That's what I wanted to, to do. And I didn't think of myself, quite frankly, I, I didn't plan to become a historian. <laughs> I, I thought of myself as a writer, wanting to be a writer, journalist, you know, like a James Baldwin, you know, people who wrote essays and sometimes novels and sometimes screenplays, th th those kinds of things. And so 
style has always been very important to me. It never occurred to me. I never thought that I wanted to be the kind of writer who just wrote, as, because as I said, I didn't think of myself as a historian. I wasn't writing to other scholars. I've always tried to write in a way that uh, will be accessible to as many people as possible. So this was kind of going back to what I was doing when I was a teen, you know, writing short stories or writing essays. And as a young person, uh, young adult, trying to become a writer. Um, so this was, it, it was a return to something for me uh, rather than just something that was brand new. Uh, this is the kind of writing that I've, I've wanted to do. Uh, I don't mind in notes. I mean, and, and I do have notes in the book for for, th for the major things that I that I you know use from that I, I learned from other people, but it's not a it's not a law review article. <laughs> it's not a, a history book where I'm going through and doing the historiography or anything like historiography or anything like that. It's essay writing, and that's I think that's a form that I where I feel the most comfortable actually, and I want to do more of it. I like doing review essays. I do a lot of reviews for the New York Review of Books. And I have an, a chance to sort of stretch out with that. And I, I like the essay form. And so it, it's it's a return to me for something that I that I long to do for many, many years. And it's not, it's not typical historical writing. <laughs> uh, even, even that though, I do try to make that as accessible as possible. But this is a return. This is coming back home for me in a way. Mm. And I, I love that. And I feel like um, it that's the sort of perfect segue for my next question, which is about um, you as a young writer um, and sort of the, the, the journey, the road you've traveled as a historian, as a writer. Do you have any advice to give to young writers, maybe those who, like you, imag imagine themselves to be the next Baldwin, or perhaps mm -hmm. others who imagine themselves to be the next Annette Gordon. <laughs> well, I would say the most important thing to me about writing was reading. Uh, you know, you really, it's very, very hard to know how to write and to try out different styles and, and do things without seeing what other people are doing. and reading and having words in your head, uh, thinking about them, thinking about the way, what's successful, what types of sentences and paragraphs and things that move you that actually get information across to you, either factual information or emotional, uh, an emotional conveyance, a conveyance of emotion in, in writing. I think reading is very, very important. I also think writing is important. You have to do it. <laughs> you know, and, and to practice at it and, and try things out. So I, I just think those are, those are the two things, the ways that I got to be a writer. I started out loving to read and I wanted to be a writer because I liked reading. I liked what other people were doing with that. And I wanted to do it myself. And I, as I mentioned before, I, I wrote short stories, I wrote essays and shared them with friends and so forth. I, I did that. That was my primary sort of hobby, you know, growing up, you know, as a teen in particular. So I think the, the advice would be to, to read and to write, to do it and have faith in yourself as well. I mean, that's, Love. I know that's difficult. And, you know, we all go through moments where we think, well, is this going to work? Am I ever going to get there? But uh, if it's really meaningful to you and it's really important to you, you know, stick with it. And, you know, we see, we know that you are speaking your truth because you are surrounded by books in, <laughs> right now, swallowed uh, uh, by books. And so, so I'm going to ask the question, this might get you in trouble, maybe me in trouble, but so what, what are you reading right now? What are the what are the books that are right by your nightstand or um, on the, I'm sure, a very tall list of books to read? Well, I'm going back to look at things that I've read before. <laughs> in some ways, I'm reading Experiment in Autobiography, again, H.G. Uh, Wells. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, reading 
uh, the the author of the Overstory, uh, Richard Powers. Like I read today that he has a new book out that I that I, I love his writing. I want to take a look at that. Uh, Elizabeth Hinton's book mm -hmm. about um, you know about the '60s and and, and protests. Uh, and I read a lot of articles mm -hmm. too. You know, I read. Someone asked was asking me this before. I find that I read less for just fun now. I mean, I, I enjoy the things that I'm reading, but there's usually a purpose for reading them. What I do now, you know, is is play the piano. <laughs> a lot of the, you know, a lot of the time that I've spent, and after that message about reading, a lot of the time that I I would normally be spending uh, on reading just so, just for fun has now been transferred into into uh, learning to play the piano again after. I don't know how many decades uh, away from it. Wow, that, you know, and, and there's so many studies that say that music and reading are, you know, um, uh, connected. And I'm also, you know, I'm, I, I do feel like reading different genres, um, whether it's fiction or poetry or nonfiction, it makes us sort of better, um, mm -hmm. better writers. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, yeah, and I, the other thing that I'm doing too is, and, and I don't know that I could talk about them, but I'm reading a lot of people's manuscripts, and there's just a lot of nice stuff that's coming out. It's going to be coming out. Uh, I was reading a manuscript about the will of John, John Randolph, mm -hmm. the controversy of the will of John Randolph, who freed his uh, freed enslaved people surprisingly at the end of his life, and the fight that these people had to have that uh, come to fruition. Um, and so doing that, I get a reading different, I think also reading people at different stages mm. and reading a manuscript and, and talking to somebody about how to turn it into a book um, is, it's interesting too. It's very, very helpful uh, to see the process as it unfolds, you know, from the, from, you know, outlines to the, you know, the manuscript and then to the finished book. And th that's been, that's actually helpful too. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I have a million other questions that I could, we could be here all night, all day, all night. Um, but I do know, I want to make certain that we have some time uh, to answer some questions from other people, not just from me. And so I'm going to reintroduce um, Heather back into um, our space so that we can move forward with, with some q and Thank you so much for uh, the conversation. It's been so interesting. I've really enjoyed listening. Before we jump into audience questions, I actually um, wanted to ask Annette a little bit about her participation without any spoilers, but if you could share a little bit about your participation in the Library of Congress National Book Festival this year, what, what, what does it look like? Conversation. And another conversation, uh, talking about the process of writing and talking about my, um, you know, my career a as a writer, and I'm looking forward to it. I I always enjoy that. This is I think this is my fourth uh, appearance in the National Book uh, found, uh, uh, Festival events, and it's always great. I really wish we could be there in person, uh, and but maybe next year. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't wait to be back to actually. It's so much fun to see all the crowds of people walking around, all different ages, you know, people all different types of looking for all different types of writing, and I I want to be able to you know do what I can even online to sort of foster that sense of diversity and the broadness and the the importance of all types of writing and genres of writing. One of the things that I, I love about the Library of Congress National Book Festival, the first time I actually got to go was in 2019, is this, um, this sense that the library is, is my library. It's a library for everyone, and, and we're all able, able to, to celebrate together. In this virtual space, what's neat is being able to also touch people across the country. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I was hoping you could share a little bit about your, your library, do you have libraries in your life that played a crucial role when you were a kid and as you got older? Do you have favorite libraries that, that you love that have made a difference in your life? 
Well, the Montgomery County Library, the Conroe Library, where I grew up, was formative for me. That's where I spent a lot of my time. Uh, when I was a kid, I you know, read everything of interest to me in that library, and I was there every weekend. Uh, that was quite important to me. When I got a driver's license, I would drive to Huntsville, which is about 35 miles away from where I lived, to the Sam Houston State Library, because it was a state library, and I was a citizen of Texas. You could go in. Everybody could go in. And so I spent a lot of time there as well. That's where I started to you know, get to read more books about, well, Monticello and Jefferson, uh, actual books that undergraduates and graduate students would be using in, in that library. That was my first big grown-up type library. And I, I love it. The New York Public Library is my favorite place in the world. <laughs> my favorite place, certainly in New York and in the world. You know, I've often said when I die, if I want to go to heaven, I want to go to the stacks there. Um, <laughs> I, that's why I wrote uh, my first book and, and parts of my other books in the New York Public Library in the Rose Reading Room there looking up at the ceiling. Uh, so I I love it. I love that place. And it's it's the go-to place for me when I when I want to start a project, when I feel that I'm bogged down with the project, that is a, that breaks the log jam for me. So I, I love it. And I like the Library of Congress as well. <laughs> it was a beautiful building. The Jefferson, I've been to a lot of conferences there, did exhibits there, uh, advised on exhibits there and so forth. It's a beautiful space. Uh, but the the library that I use and write in today is is the New York Public Library. And is, I'm sorry, is it the one on near 42nd Street? And well, yes, with the uh, with the Lions, Patience and Fortitude. Yes. And so back there in, in the background. Wow. <laughs> and we actually have a few questions. So the first one is actually um, from someone who says, Professor Gordon Reed, wonderful book. Your observations about turn of the century Galveston were fascinating. How did you compare at the time with New Orleans um, and other major port cities? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's a good question. Um, I knew something about Galveston because my family, because of my family connection to it that I mentioned in the book, but I didn't know anything about it. It's fascinating. I mean, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to answer the question because that's what I want to do. I'm, I'm actually thinking about writing something about Galveston. I mean, I have other books in the hopper, but I was just fascinated by this idea of this place where, where African Americans, people like my great grandfather, who you know, went there to work on the docks. He had a farm in cotton, a cotton farm in, in Texas, but he would go in East Texas, but he would go to Galveston to work on the, the docks off season to make extra money for the family and so forth. And to find out that there was black men who were in unions at this time and were uh, people who were involved in politics during you know reconstruction and then everything sort of tamps down. But of all the places in Texas, Galveston was the most open and the black people there were considered, you know, the word uppity, that they were very confident people. Jack Johnson, the very, you know, volatile and, you know, voluble uh, heavyweight champion was from Galveston. I, so I, you asked the question, what, how do you compare it? That's what I want to know. I mean, that's my next, I, I really do think that if it's not a book, uh, certainly an article, I, I really want to invent, explore that world because it's just, it's just fascinating. I mean, to think of people operating who were doing the best that they could, sort of breaking through the cracks as much as they could to achieve things under really, really dire circumstances. But Galveston was less dire than other places. But I really want to try to flesh all of that out. That was the most exciting part of, for me, the most eye-opening part of, of my research for this book. Right, I think um, we have a few other questions. One coming uh, right from Facebook. Um, always wanted to read Baldwin, but intimidated about where to begin with all of his works. Professor, can you suggest a good entry point to Baldwin? I like No Name in the Street. It's a good book of essays. And a, a more obscure book is The Devil Finds Work which is uh, his essays about movies. 
Mm. And that's kind of fun. I mean, and because there would there would be movies that you've probably undoubtedly seen and you get to see his reaction to them. So I think No Name in the Street, um, The Devil Finds Work is in, in terms of the essays. If Beale Street Could Talk is maybe his, for me, his best novel, maybe. Uh, one that I, like, I liked the most you know, complete. Um, so those are the things that I would think of. So you t spoke a lot about kind of the, that you really like this genre, right? That you really enjoyed it. And it almost sounded like you're working on something. And a question from someone on Facebook is, what is your next big project? My next big projects, my next overdue project, <laughs> um, <laughs> vastly overdue project is the Hemings is a Monticello part two. I'm going to follow the family, after Jefferson's death through the 19th century up to probably the Great War. Uh, and, and, and because then the world changes after the uh, after World War I, that's sort of a, a famous break in uh, the sort of world sensibilities and so forth. So um, yeah, a civil, mainly a largely a civil war book and a book about the 1870s, the 1880s. I, I have, I'm following one line of the family that remained in the black community and the line of the family that went into the white community, the one that we know of, uh, the two eldest children went into the white community and we don't really know where they, where they are, uh, where they went and where their descendants are. Um, I might try to figure that out, but that seems a hopeless thing. But yeah, so it's the Hemings is the, Mont the Monticello part two. I'm doing a, a Jefferson reader on race. I've collected, I'm collecting his statements about race and commenting on them and doing color commentary on, on his, uh, his attitudes about race. Uh, so those are the two things in the, in the immediate hopper, but I really do want to get started on this thing about Galveston. It's, you know, I, I may talk to my editor about this. <laughs> um, you know, I, I have to deliver the Hemingses and I'm, I'm interested, I'm, I'm excited to do it. I've started writing and, and pulling it together. And then once that process gets going, as, as you know, Erica, you know, you just kind of fall into it and it just keeps going. So I, I'm glad now that I, I couldn't do any, because of the pandemic, I couldn't do the archival research that I wanted to do. I, I'm sort of a year behind uh, because of that, but I want to get started on that again. Yeah, I, I think you know, most people don't recognize how the pandemic actually um, interrupted the work of historians that yes. can be in archives. So um, we're all looking forward to more and more of the archives opening <laughs> up so that we can get the work done. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's important. So here, here's another question is specifically about the way you read. And it's, um, do you read one book at a time or do you read a few or several? At a time. No, I'm reading several at a time. I mean, that's a habit from being a kid. I was always checking out lots of different books, and um, I, I do that now. That's why you're you're stumping me on the what I'm reading because they're <laughs> I don't know where do I start with these things. Um, yeah, I, I like to read uh, more than one book at a time because I yeah, there's just so much out there. In, in terms of just backing up for a second, digitized archives, how I like to touch primary source material in my hands. Do you have a preference? Um, and, and if so, why do you have that preference? And, and what do you like about one way or the other? Well, I, you know, it, it's sort of, I just remember working on my first book and getting on the train from New York and going down to Richmond, Virginia to the, Library of Virginia and the Virginia Historical Society and so forth. Um, I like primary documents. Um, I'm happy to have newspapers online. I mean, it makes it much easier to press a button and see them there to see it right there and then to see the the searches. But not everything is on is digitized, right? Not everything is there. You have to go through people's letters, and there's something about touching and handling material that actual people touched and handled that's it's you know i don't i don't it's 
spiritual. It's some, there's something about it that's to me is very, very powerful. I, I feel connected to the person in a way that I don't feel as much when I'm looking at something online. Um, so it, I'm not overly fond of obviously the, the microfilm. I'm glad to get rid of that, <laughs> that as much as possible, but you know, letters, looking at people's letters or looking at, I, I talk in the Hemings is a Monticello about looking at Jefferson's farm book, seeing the farm book at the Massachusetts Historical Society. They let me look at it before they put it away finally. And to see it as much smaller than I thought it was. And all these years I had in my mind, him opening up a big book, like a big ledger book, but it's tiny. And the handwriting is, you know, neat and everything. And you just, you just kind of wonder how did he do that without making mistakes? He must be, he's an interesting person. But um, yeah, that's, that's a, it's a visceral feeling to me. Do you feel that way, Erica? I mean, it's, you, you it, it transports you almost. You feel yeah. uh, as if you're in that space. You've shared something with the author of the diary or the ledger or the, the letter, and it, it, it transports you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to explain. I mean, people probably think that's kind of, you know, spooky in a way that you're saying, but there's just something, it is. There's something about holding something that another person held and a person that you are writing about and thinking about. Um, that's that's actually quite meaningful. So you don't want to ever don't want to lose that process, um, and lose that as a. I'm I'm grateful for the digitized things because you can do so much stuff with that. But you're doing something different, you know, <laughs> different. It's a different way of researching, a different way of approaching the material. Well, it's sometimes faster, but it also can leave things out. And I think oh, that that's, that is definitely the case. That's yeah. definitely the case. I mean, I at the Virginia Historical Society, I mean, they had, they had their old card catalogs and people wrote all kinds of little things that weren't, when they you know put it online, they didn't bother to put every single thing there. And some of that stuff are things, they're things that you know, if you have been researching it, that other people may not think is important, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it actually is important. So always look at the, uh, the card catalogs because you have the accretion of many you know, decades of little notations and things that uh, that are more important just than the call number, certainly. We're always going to want to hold on to, you know, the, the, the reason to go to the archives, right, to hold the document, the letter. But I, I will say, you know, although I prefer that, there is, you know, there's a democratizing Oh yeah, access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, the things that you can get access to now, you know that um, when things that I went to England for, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, years back. Then now I can. You know, it was great to go to have to go to England for it, an excuse to do that. But uh, now other people can have access to it if it's not behind a paywall. Uh, right. Lots of people can have access to it, and that that's important. So everything is a trade off, you know. It is. You know, they're good points and bad points. Well, I just, I'd like to thank both of you so very much for joining us and for having this conversation. Um, Annette, thank you for transporting us with, with your book. It's it's amazing. And and we're just so appreciative that you took the time to spend with us to explain your process and your thinking and how, how you came to this amazing work. Erica, thank you for guiding the conversation with your thoughtful questions and, you know, helped just to take us on, on this really fun journey for the last hour. Um, so we need to close the conversation, but I'd like to thank you both. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining PBS Books. We will be here on Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Uh, with Tana French, uh, the author of Searcher. But don't forget, uh, to watch, if you haven't yet, the PBS one hour documentary special. Uh, you can stream it at PBS um, and it is airing across the country in many markets. So please, if you don't know, go to pbs.org, but also Friday launches the National Book Festival and that's when all the fun begins. So, and that's loc.gov slash bookfest. So from Heather Marie Montia, it's been my pleasure to spend the last hour with you. Have a nice evening and thank you.